My name is uh, L.C. Horton, Staff Sergeant with Marine Bombing Squadron 611, VMB 611. I was assigned the squadron in, in uh, August, uh, early 19, late 1943, early 1944, and uh, I was uh, commissioned out in uh, November of 19. 45. In the fall of 1942, my uh, best friend and I went out to March Air Force Base to sign up to be in the Army Air Corps. We went out, we accepted, and we were waiting around to be called in. Saw some of my buddies who had graduated in June of 42, had not been called in yet. So I pushed a panic button, it sounds silly now, but I was afraid the war was going to be over before I had a chance to get in and do my thing. Went down to a Marine recruiter and uh, he assured me that uh, I could be eligible for what was then called the Naval Air Pilot Program, NAP program. So I signed up and uh, I'm down in boot camp in San Diego in the Marine Corps. I got called in and the guy informed me that uh, uh, that program had been canceled. I had never been in an airplane, but I knew I wanted to fly. So I said, how about Navigator Bombardier? Sounded good to me. And so I remember the excitement of hitchhiking back to my parents' house, because we lived in San Bernardino, and to let them know that I'm going to be a, a Navigator Bombardier. Okay, went back to base. Got called in again, and that program had been canceled. Well, I knew I wanted to fly, so I said, well, what are my options? He said, well, you go aviation machinist mate or tail gunner. I wasn't much of a mechanic. Or you could be an ordnance gunner, be a turret gunner. And uh, I uh, said, no, I, I, I don't think I want to mess around with bombs. So my third option was radio school, radio gunner. And uh, I went to radio school and gunnery school. Did well in gunnery school, I actually came out number one. And so I picked up my sergeant stripes out of gunnery school. I then had a chance to choice of aircraft. Didn't know a lot about it, but I built airplanes as a small kid. The uh, TBM, if people know the TBM and where the radio bin is on a TBM is right on the belly, and that lands on an aircraft carrier. Mom didn't <laughs> raise someone to fall off the truck. So the other was the B-25 PBJ. So I then went to uh, Cherry Point as a radio bin and was uh, assigned uh, uh, to no, Marine Bombing Squadron 611, VMB 611. And th so the first time I went up in an aircraft, I went up in a B-25 at a night orientation meeting. And I can remember so vividly that I, I looked out that waste window and looked back at the rudders and the rudders were just, they were just giving it this. And I thought, whoops, maybe I made a mistake. But then I did uh, stick with VMB 611, of course, and throughout the time. That's my familiarity with the B-25. or. PBJ. My first aircraft off the ground was in a B-25 PBJ. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that would be a Cherry Point in uh, 1940, latter 43, 44, early 44. Some of the most fun I had was when I was going to gunnery school because in gunnery school they had these tracks and you could ride a track with a turret and it's like track shooting traps and skeet. So you could track and shoot, you did a lot of shotgun practice, trap and skeet. In, in Page Field then, we would, uh, they would have a tow target. And, and the interesting story here is, uh, my pilot, H.K. Horton, made second, uh, uh, first lieutenant, apparently the night before one of our days, when we were out for uh, target practice against the tow, tow plane. There's a lot of movement in there. You're up and around and about, and you're doing a lot of firing. And so that was the kind of practice we had. But uh, when we got, got back down to Page Field, I noticed that uh, our pilot went into the hangar, came back out with a little bucket because he had gotten airsick because of all the movement in his. He had partied a little too heavily the night before celebrating, celebrating his promotion to first lieutenant. We actually were trained in Boca Chica, Florida uh, to, to be torpedo bombers. And we had a torpedo section in our squadron. That was kind of fun too, chasing uh, our destroyers to torpedo them. 
but uh, overseas, although we had a torpedo department, uh, the occasion never never developed uh, to, for us to have to specifically uh, use the torpedo. So that was uh, that was never done. Our pilot didn't have uh, seniority, so we, our crew, including our pilot, we were on the Zoella Likes, which is a troop ship, and. Uh, we, we left, we were in difference of opinion, but basically left the, her overseas in August of, of uh, 44. And we went to Ulithi, that's uh, a, a, a large anchorage in Western Carolines. We were there as a matter of fact when Task Force 58 came in for the, ultimately the Battle of, of uh, the Philippine Sea. And uh, well, we were, what had happened Actually, when we left the stage, we were, we were, our squad was assigned to the uh, island of Yap, which is uh, in the Philippine area. And so en route, Nimitz and uh, MacArthur apparently got together and decided to bypass Yap. So here's a squadron heading overseas to an island that's still occupied by the Japanese. So that created some confusion <laughs> until they found the, uh, our other uh, senior pilots went down to Emeru. And, uh, and I can remember the day that uh, we were more or less found in, sitting there in Ulithi and flying, and we were flown back down to our base in uh, Emeru and we operated out of Emeru initially. I had been on the boxing team on the, on the ship uh, at, at the, uh, coming over through from uh, States to, uh, to uh, Ulithi. And, uh, and we, but when you went on in, for boxing, you, you, you got cigarettes and I didn't smoke. So I happened to uh, have one lady for did all my laundry the time I was in Zamboanga for just a package of cigarettes. So we, 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 we had a pretty fair condition. It, it, it rained a lot, uh, monsoon season, this kind of thing. And I think it was a period of time I was given $500 for a cement place to walk on, but we got out okay. But it was, uh, it, initially we had to be very careful though, because actually our, our ground crew went in when, when the Japanese were just on the other side of the airstrip. And so initially when we flew out of, out of Zamboanga, we had to be very careful at night that there wasn't infiltration into our camp. So that, they got pushed back farther and uh, so some of our early missions were very, were very local. <laughs> but eventually, uh, we expanded, and uh, our, our, our squadron was, was uh, specially equipped to do low-level low work. So most of our missions in the Philippines were low-level. <clears throat> one, uh, one of our very special missions is uh, that uh, we, uh, our, our plane actually caught a couple of Japanese PT boats in a, a place called a bit of Saraganic Bay. And that was pretty active with that that particular. We did we we uh, we actually sank eventually two two uh, PT boats. I will hate to say humor though. The waters are so big in some places that they have small sailboats. On and just, just that, and and we were a little flat hatting on the way back usually, and then, and sometimes our our pilots would raise up over high enough to get over the sails of the sailboat and drop down. Just so the prop washing <laughs> would not would take a long. You could see we didn't make any friends in the Philippines in that respect because these guys are all bailing out out of these boats as we do on pass. But the Japanese were were really hated by the Filipinos, and uh, so they were they they took very good care of us as a as a culture and, and society. <clears throat> this is what made their plane, I think, very special. Fire, the pilots were in control of two package 50 calibers on each side, so that's four 50s firing forward. They were also responsible for four five inch rockets under each wing. So that's eight rockets firing forward. And we had the 50 in the nose, so that's another 50 caliber. And we had twin 50s in the top turret firing forward. I was the waist gunner and I took care of both sides. And our tail gunner was the uh, twin 50s on the tail. So it, it was uh, for the work that we did in the Philippines. Uh, the plane was 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 uh, quite exceptional. Once in a while, and I don't know what determined we would we would we would uh, fly a seventh person as a 
as a second radio man, then we then he would be responsible for one side, and I would be responsible for the other. But uh, basically, we flew six, and I was responsible depending on the target. I can remember one night, as a matter of fact, we got we we caught a uh, a convoy of Japanese trucks at night up on the, this and the roadways are not roadway so there's they can go nowhere but one direction on the, the road dropped a flare and so we just they spent a lot of time on that but i can remember calling up to the pilot i said i said let's go sideways once i can get my shots in <laughs> and, uh we were we were we we didn't we did some medium altitude bombing in um uh, uh in emero at medium altitude over uh, rabal which was a a, a heavy Japanese naval base and, and Kaviang, which is a new that was another one. But in the Philippines, our bomb loads, uh, we do some skip bombing, and uh, they were the smaller, smaller bombs. I'm not sure of the com complete ordinance, but I think we had about a 5,000 pound capacity hit the bay. But most of our, we didn't do a lot of bombing in the Philippines. But what we did was, would, would, would be the low level skip bombing kind of things. Uh, I'll share one other little thought that these things are coming back kind of slowly, but uh, we had a, some kind of a sight on a 50, <clears throat> an electric sight of some kind. I don't think I ever used it because I've used my tracer. And, uh, we loaded our own ammo, and I, I forget just what it was now, but something like armor piercing, armor piercing incendiary, and a tracer. So I uh, just, uh, you, you have a pretty good view of where you're. They were shooting, but at that one one time though, the in the in the bay we, uh, that we were chasing those PT boats. I remember that uh, when I started like my traces were going all over. They were they were I'd worn out barrels and two waist guns, that, which you're not supposed to do. We get short bursts, but uh, well, we make a lot of short bursts. Uh, you use the you had to take the old barrels back and load two new ones in for the next flight. Our, our basic schedule was you would, you would have a mission one day, you'd have a working party another day, and then maybe a wreck activity, and then you're, you're flying again the next day. So basically, I, we did, if you weren't flying missions, you were out doing some work of some kind for the squadron. No, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> filling sandbags. Uh, doing general cleanup deals, but the Marine Corps didn't let you sit around and do nothing. I have to share one other thing, if I may. After view, I had 19 missions, or rather over 25 missions flown when I was still 19. But you're entitled to R&R &R in Australia after 25 missions. So we put all of our crews in a hat, and uh, for 10 days wrecked after to Australia. We were number six on the list. These other four crews that came back, uh, came back with great tales of the stories in Australia because the Australian men were in the European War. So there are a lot of ladies in, uh, down there in, in Australia that uh, became uh, available for dates. So we, as a 19 year old, you're, you know, you do have a few raging hormones. And uh, lo and behold, six crews went and uh, we were just about get, getting ready to go when we got called up uh, to give uh, close air support for the invasion of Southern Philippines. And uh, so I never did get my R&R. &R. The rest of my time was spent there out of uh, Zamboanga. We were, it was called MAGZAM, Marine Air Group Zamboanga. And uh, I flew the rest of my, my time there until I was relieved. I was the first person of our crew to be relieved because I had flown more missions than anyone else. And in those days, you, the numbers were given to you uh, by missions flown. And and well, I'll, I'll carry it on one a little bit farther. We um, uh, looked at uh, what was going on, and as I was actually picked up and, and headed back home. We thought at that time that we, we would be picking up new aircraft for the invasion of Japan. So I'm on the island of Samar waiting to pick up the troop ship home when they dropped the first bomb. 
And there's all the speculation as to what was in this bomb to do such damage, what you didn't know. And I was on the troop ship at, actually, at sea where they dropped the second bomb. And then I knew I was going home. And I have to confess that it was a, a, a parochial feeling that uh, you, I, wasn't, that I, I was home to stay in. And I was very anxious to get into service to do my thing. Okay. But I was also, and having done, I flew, I flew 43 missions, 43 combat missions, okay? We had a casualty rate of about 30%, somewhere in that line. I lost a lot of good friends. So when I knew I was headed home, it was a matter of walking away from that flight. It was just a matter of that now I'm ready to go on with my life in a different way. Um, it's been on it. I was kept pretty busy. I, uh, <clears throat> I kind of, I'm kind of proud of the fact that I enrolled at UC Berkeley in the spring of '46 and graduated from Berkeley in the class of '49. That's a four-year program into three. Married and had a son. The only social event I had. And that it was I, my graduation ball, and I had to borrow a sport coat for my stepfather. And, and uh, Ron will appreciate this. My dress blues I wore only one time, and that was to get married. But I, but I, I kept. <clears throat> I took the red stripe off of them, so I had a a pair of dress blues dress pants through college if I ever had a chance to <laughs> use it. Uh, it was it was it was different. You know, I got a letter one day saying the President of the United States has awarded you the Distinguished Flying Cross. Would you like to come down to El Toro for the proper ceremonies? But like I said, I was ready to go to Berkeley. I, I, I'm ready to go to Berkeley. And, uh, and I said, no, they gave me an alternative, but get, then we will come uh, and make this, the, the, the ceremony there at, uh, at my wife's uh, parents' home. Yeah. So, the, so they actually had, but it was just, a, it's hard to explain. I wasn't still proud of having served in the Marine Corps, but I was ready to do something else with my life and, and school and so forth. I became involved with the restoration of this, this plane when Dave Fish attended our squad reunion in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, we were able, I would have to be president of, the, of that reunion, and I was able to, we knew we were going to disband as an official group. So we were able to get what monies we had left over, and through Dave Fish, donated it here to Camarillo for the restoration of PBJ 1J. And my daughter, Debbie, got in touch with, uh, with uh, Dave, and we made arrangements for to donate my uniforms to the museum here, that kind of thing, and the photos. I had some pictures of our, of our, of our, uh, our squadron, that, some of our missions, and donate those also to the squadron. And then the first day that we came here, which I thought was just, uh, again, that the procedure of dropping this and dropping them off to people and, and, uh, and uh, saying thank you and so forth, but you, you guys are all here with a, a reception I'll never forget. And we've tried to keep in touch ever since. And I, would, I must say, uh, to be accepted by such a great group of people in such a worthwhile project, but that, when you look at the, the, what's going on here, when you take a, the restoration of aircraft that started in 1993, and uh, I know you folks that went back and picked it up and had to borrow a wing to fly it here, to watch it, to watch it emerge as that beautiful bird that's sitting behind me, uh, I can hardly, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>